Welcome back everyone to another start to finish digital sculpting video. This time around, I am collaborating with the amazing Chelsea Gracie. Chelsea is an incredible artist with a strong understanding of fundamentals and a host of amazing content over on her YouTube channel. Most recently, the first part of this video collab. So if you are checking out this video before watching her part of the collab, hit pause, check out part one at the link in the description, and then head back here to see me digitally sculpt her character. I am so glad that Chelsea agreed to let me work on one of her characters. I ended up giving her a few different prompts. The one that she ended up choosing was a witty thief that always gets into trouble. Uh, so she has attached the character somewhere in her email to me. I have not opened it up yet. I have my email open though, and I'm about to open it for the first time. I'm gonna put it up on screen as well. Here we go, let's check it out. <laughs> Ooh, okay, okay, I'm liking it. Oh wow, this hair is super crazy. I'm trying to figure out what is going on with this hair. Very cloudy. She's also attached some sketches that make this make a lot more sense, I think. Okay, I am digging this hair a lot. <laughs> That's very cool. It's very unique. It almost feels like um, some feather boa kind of forms going on there. All right, I need to zoom in a little bit because this is pretty small on my phone, but checking out the rest of the form, loving the stuff going on in the body, the costuming. I love whenever someone takes these costume elements or accessories and really breaks the anatomical form of a character. So there's a lot of really cool form going on with her legs there, with the poofy pants. I am really excited to watch Chelsea's video along with you guys, I haven't seen it yet, to uh, figure out like what's going on with the little contraption that she has dangling from the string there. It's some kind of gemstone, so maybe it's something for picking locks. I don't know, she's a witty thief uh, that gets herself into trouble a lot, but I love this design, I love this character. The face is absolutely gorgeous, beautiful silhouette. I cannot wait to get started on this and the extra sketches for the extra uh, views for the front, back, and side there really make a huge difference when you are translating something to 3D. So this is gonna be awesome. I can't wait to get started on it. I'm gonna set up a few things, and then I'm gonna get right into sculpting. In this video, I'm going to be showing you my entire digital sculpting process from beginning to end. If you are new around here, click that subscribe button. And if you want to learn more about digital sculpting, check out gumroad.com slash polygon for all of my brushes, materials, courses, and other fun goodies. Now, I'm sure many of you know exactly where we go from here, taking our good and faithful best friend, the sphere, <laughs> and squashing them all over the place. I start blocking out the major shapes of my character with a sphere because, well, it's quick and easy to do. My goal isn't to be perfect at this stage, but rather just get something on the canvas. I've talked about other ways you can block out characters in the past, and if you want to learn more about my process, check out the video in the corner. Once I get something on my canvas, then I can really start to worry about proportions. You need all the parts to compare against before you can worry about proportions. This is when I start pushing my shapes more in the direction of the character I'm trying to create, while not trying to be too specific in any one area. I try to work fast and ignore small mistakes, instead focusing on larger forms as much as possible. Now, you're not going to get everything perfect in the first round. I don't get everything perfect right away, that's for certain. So don't feel bad if things are looking a bit alien in the beginning. Sculpting is an iterative process, and that means it's going to take some time to get where you're going. I like to focus on large changes as much as I can now, and then hone in on a few specific areas. That way, when I'm done working on one area, and I zoom back out, I've given my eyes some time to refresh, and I can find new mistakes to correct. The first area that I give a little more focus to here is going to be the legs, or pants rather. That's because instead of wasting time creating some upper legs that no one will ever see, I would rather spend more time creating an accurate shape for the pants. I'm choosing to do this to save on time and also get those early proportions down faster. Like I mentioned previously, focus on big shapes first. And then of course I had to take a quick moment to play around with the new dynamic simulation tools available in the newest ZBrush update. I'm actually a ZBrush beta tester, so I've been playing with these for a while. I just haven't had a chance to show them off on the channel yet. And I'd like to work on a character where I can show you guys a little more with the new tool set, because it is really awesome. And if you do want to see more of it being used, I play around with it in a video linked on screen right now, which is an episode from a new series that I've been playing around with called ZBrush and Chill where I do some live sculpting on my channel while playing some chill music. 
If that sounds interesting to you, I've been live streaming around 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern US time, which I know is super early for a lot of you, but it's super early for me too, but hey, that's what time works best right now. And I plan on switching that up more in the future. Another area I really like to work on a bit more in the beginning is my character's face. And that's because it is typically the most important part of your character. It's the focal point and the first thing that everyone is going to look at. I will often spend just as much time working on my faces as I do everything else combined. And this face was an absolute pleasure to work on. I had a ton of fun figuring this one out, especially the cheek area was really tough, but looked great by the time I was finished. I thought it would be fun to give a few sculpting tips here for working on faces. Hopefully you guys don't mind. Starting off, your priority should be to find your bony landmarks. So I get the general shape of the head first, then map out my jawline, my eye socket, and bridge of the nose. Once you get those in place, you're probably going to need to move some things around for a while. And that's because everything on the face works cohesively, which is really cool, but also <laughs> really frustrating. That's because one small change to, let's say, the position of your nose, for instance, will change the whole structure and proportion of your face. So after you get your bony landmarks figured out, take your time and get them where they need to go. As you can see with my head, I keep everything nice and sharp, and that's because it's very easy to use something like your smooth brush later and, well, <laughs> make it smooth. So focus on the hard and sharp plane changes first, then smooth it later on. I'll talk more about the face later, but for now it's time to move on to the body. For this character, it was nice to think of the torso as two separate shapes split at the rib cage. In the lower half of that, the hips were used to combine with the pants to continue shaping up that area. I do more cleanup here in a moment, but not before I move down to the legs and work on their shape a little bit more as well. And I really like these legs. There were some really cool shapes coming through in the sculpt, and they were fun to push and exaggerate. I use what are called polygroups, which are those separate colors you see on the leg, to help tell ZBrush how I want my edges to flow. That essentially means that I can use certain tools and brushes more easily. And that is always nice when you're talking about digital sculpting. I combine a few parts for the pants so that I can blend the geometry to create one solid piece. And now I'm noticing how terrifying <laughs> those eyes are up top. I don't really think about it while I'm sculpting because I'm hyper-focused on where I'm going and not where it is right now. So I leave all sorts of weird placeholdery stuff all the time, much like those bulging eyes. But I will say they are very helpful for proportions and as a reminder to work more on that area later. Just a little more cleanup to the pants and feet. We have no use for toes here, so I just smooth and blend those all together. They will be covered by shoes later anyway, so no worries there. And we will move on to some quick color block out and minor tweaks to the character. And then it's back up to the face to work on a whole lot. Starting with the eyes, eyes are really tough of course, and you probably don't need me to tell you that. I spend a long time on these eyes to get them to a place where I am happy with them, starting off messy, similar to everything else, and slowly refining from there. I mentioned earlier how one area can affect everything else with your face. Well, the eyes are the biggest offender of that rule especially with this character's cheekbone, or major hit of the side plane of the face. This thing is huge on this character, and I love it, but it was super tough to get right. Before I get things super accurate, I like to get them looking good. You have to rely a lot on your experience and knowledge, all while also using your observational skills. So the super early stages involve a lot of observation, then as you start refining, you'll have to rely a little more on your experience, and then slowly start to work in more observation as you push closer and closer towards the thing that you're referencing. I'll also say, if I haven't already, that faces are just really tough to sculpt, especially female faces. And that is for a number of reasons, but one of the main reasons being the softer and rounder forms more common in feminine faces are much harder to create than sharper, blockier forms. That is more difficult because of the same reason why it's easier to draw a straight line than a curve. And it's exactly why I recommend starting off by sculpting those hard and sharp planed out forms first, and then smoothing them later on. I've now created what is called a mouth bag, which is just a fancy way of saying a cavity for the inside of your mouth. I also did that for the eyes, but they're hollow. And I spend a bit more time on some of the facial features, mainly the lips and nose right now. Wow, we are really focusing in on this face a lot during this video. Hopefully that's okay, I think it's a lot of fun to be more focused in some videos over others. Plus, I really enjoyed working on this face, and I think you guys will enjoy getting to see a more focused breakdown here. I quickly block out a weird chef's hat for our girl, another one of those placeholders I talked about earlier, and then begin working on the torso and arms. The chest looks like it has almost no fat for breasts, so I of course took that into account when sculpting. 
She was also pretty muscular, so I have to get those forms represented. I keep most of this pretty simple and clean, and enjoy the end result here quite a lot. I do minor tweaking later, but I was for the most part pretty happy with where this was at this stage. I do some more tweaking and adjusting to the arms, trying to make room for the hands while also paying attention to proportions for the entire figure. I had the arms way too thick at the stage, and they needed to be toned down pretty literally, but also in general scale. I moved down to the legs to make some of the secondary forms down there that make up the cuff of the pants, as well as the metallic piece that moves up the front of the shin. I'm not entirely sure on the purpose here, but it looks cool and I think it adds some nice visual interest to the pants. The straps and bags also help with that a lot as well. Now back on up to the face for some more changes. I told you we are really focusing on the face a lot in this one. After some minor tweaks to proportions, I insert a cylinder to represent the teeth. This is all I'm going to have for the final character, as I really just need a plane and a little splash of color to represent the teeth. But this process is also really helpful for figuring out the shape of your lips and the area around your mouth. And that is because your lips wrap around the cylinder of your teeth. So it helps you figure out how rounded that area needs to be. I often see people make it really flat, and if that sounds like a problem you might have, I would say give this a shot. Next, I tweak the shape of the eyebrows I've created, as well as the shape of the brow underneath. I over-sculpt a little bit, but this is just how I typically work. I like to exaggerate and then come back in and reduce some form. I've talked about this before in other videos, but for those that aren't familiar, the purpose of exaggeration is to push something to the breaking point and then kind of nudge it back a little bit to try to push your work as far as you can without it looking completely broken and awkward. Then the eyelashes need to be made. For this area, it's super simple because I already have geometry from the eyelid, so I duplicate my head and delete everything else except for a small strip of geometry that I can repurpose for the eyelash. After that, all it takes is some small adjusting to get it into place. I also take some time to continue working on my eyes, focusing in on the eyelids to improve their shape. The top lid was too soft and rounded, and the bottom lid was way too flat as it transitioned into the cheek. So I had to create a better plane change around that area. I also work on blending the outer top corner of the brow to soften the transition there. You have something called the lacrimal gland on the upper lateral side that pushes the surface out and informs a lot of the shape of your lid to brow transition. I think there may also be some fat there, but for the most part, a little softening and inflating helped to make that area look more natural. Next up, I create the straps around the waist and hip area that is attached to the bags. For this, I used my cube tube brush, which is available on my Gumroad, link below, and wrap that form around the shape of the character. In the newest version of ZBrush, you have the ability to apply thickness dynamically, which means that you don't have to actually create it. It's like a preview, and you can edit a ton of settings on the fly. And it's something I never really thought I wanted or needed, but now that I have it, I've been using it all the time. There's some other new features called Micropoly that essentially allow you to quickly add some fun textures to clothing or anything else. Here's what that looks like on her shirt. I won't be using this on the character because I, well, don't need it, <laughs> but it's still fun to play with. There's a bunch of fun patterns in here by default, and you can create your own as well. Now onto making some bags. If you've watched me sculpt for a while, then it probably looks like I start everything with a sphere. Well, that's not always the case. Here with this shape, I'm starting with a cube, simply because it's closer to the shape that I need. Then with ZBrush's poly modeling tool, the Z Modeler brush, I can manually adjust each and every part of the geometry to get exactly what I need. There's some new updated functions here as well that are super nice. We can finally extrude edges, and I know that doesn't mean anything to a lot of you, but it's a really big deal for me. It's a function that should have been there from the beginning, but you know, it's here now, so I can't really complain. I would love to talk about the latest update more, but we need to move on. The gemstone is next, and I'm really curious about this because it has to serve some kind of purpose for the thief character, and I'm really interested to see Chelsea's explanation for that. My guess is that it's some kind of magical charm or lantern or something in that vein, and if she's always getting into trouble, right, she's a witty thief that always gets into trouble, that was the prompt, well then maybe carrying a light source around with her everywhere she goes is one of the reasons for that. So normally I am very particular about following the shapes and edge flow of a reference, but for the gemstone I decided to get it pretty close and then use something called decimation to create something that looks more like a gemstone. Decimation sounds really dark and serious, but I promise it's not. Well, at least not in 3D. So decimation is something that reduces the number of polygons in an object while retaining the same shape. So if you have a flat surface, it will use less polygons in that area, and more where they're needed. So I reduced the number of polygons in this gemstone to give it a more faceted look, 
and like I said, it doesn't match perfectly, but it's close enough. I spend some more time on the legs and also the feet. I have to flatten and thin them out to get them closer to Chelsea's character. It's a pretty fun shape and it doesn't take too much time to get it where I need it to go. I even add some poly paint to make it look closer to the image, but I'll extrude some actual shoes here very soon, and I do a similar process for the little black straps around the shoes as well. But that's enough smelly feet talk, it's on to the hair, or clouds should I say. <laughs> I'm excited to hear more about the hair from Chelsea as well. It was really fun to work on, not the most difficult thing on the character, I think that was the face, but it was very time consuming. And that's because I needed to figure out how all of this flowed together. The side view that was provided helped give me a better idea of the depth for the hair, but it was more of a sketch than anything, so I didn't let it inform any decisions over the final front view of the character. So I had to start somewhere, so I started with the main shape, trying to gauge the proportions there, and then I chopped it up into some of the medium-sized segments. Really just crazy cool shapes here, but like I said, definitely a huge challenge. And then there are these floating parts that aren't even connected to the hair, which don't make any sense if this is just hair, right? So Chelsea explained to me in an email that the hair is meant to be reminiscent of clouds. She imagined the character being from a world that's covered in perpetual fog. So the poofy hair is supposed to help her blend into her surroundings and be more sneaky. And really this character as a whole is just super unique and cool. I like how it breaks norms in many different ways. As I mentioned, this hair was difficult to sculpt. Hair is just plain hard. And for a number of reasons. Hair is like a character unto itself. And that means you have to consider many different things when sculpting hair. Things similar to if you were posing a character. The line of action, which is an imaginary line that informs the larger general flow of a pose, also exists here in the hair as well. This flow of the larger shape has to look good not just from the front view, but also the side and the back and well, <laughs> every other angle as well. And that can be really hard. Trust me, I do it all the time and it's still a struggle. Then once you have the larger form down, you need to break it up into smaller segments, and each and every one of those has a line of action or flow as well, and all of those need to integrate into the larger shape and play nicely all together. And there are even more things to consider, such as hard and soft edges, a clean silhouette, contrast, and much more. Hey, no wonder I get so many comments asking for more tutorials on hair. Hopefully now I'm painting a picture of why hair is so difficult. I will talk a little bit more about this hair, but I won't be working on it again until after I pose the character. It's very difficult to get the proportions and shapes as correct as you can if everything else isn't where it's supposed to be. It feels very awkward the way it's flowing off to the side, yet the rest of the character is super stiff. I'll do more with it soon, but first, let's talk about noses. Noses, you say? You've already sculpted her nose. Well, yes, <laughs> but it could be better. In terms of pixel information from Chelsea's character, there isn't too much to go on, simply because it's a small portion of the image. The nose is fairly small on the face, and I kept it that way up to this point, but we are viewing it from a three-quarter view, so I wanted to make it more wide. I also didn't want the nose to look too Caucasian, so widening helped to push it to feel a bit more racially accurate as well. I'll do some similar form changes around the mouth soon, but first, let's take a look at our hands. Ah, <sighs> oh man. <laughs> hands. My friend, my enemy, my frenemy. <laughs> How I both love and hate you. Hands are another one of those parts of the body that feel like they have as much character as a full figure. And these hands are no different. Luckily, one of them, the right hand, was a little easier than the other. After flaring out a small portion of the wrist to start sculpting on that to convert it into a glove, the rest was fairly straightforward. And that is because most of the fingers here are straight. Minus the pinky on the end, but one little finger can't cause too much trouble. The other hand was a bit more complex. I had to adjust each finger uniquely, and getting the thumb into the correct position for a pose like this is challenging. Then I needed to make many adjustments to get the wrist portion to bend down at a very sharp angle. I approached this like I would a severe arm bend by separating the geometry temporarily. Then after warping and getting it where I need, plus a little bit of sculpting, I can merge them back together and then blend any seams I might have. I did some work on the bags earlier, but they weren't finished. So I head back down there to add some secondary forms, things like seams, stitching, buttons, and some general shape changes. I obsess over a lot of things while I'm sculpting to make sure they are as accurate and as clean as possible, and that can take a lot of time. I never try to rush while I'm sculpting unless I'm under a tight deadline. There just really isn't any benefit to rushing a sculpt, where by taking extra time, you can make sure it's done right. And you can sometimes even save yourself time later down the road. Better to do it once slowly than twice quickly. Here I make some large changes to the face, the main one being the pulling out around the cheek area. 
By this point, you have noticed that I jump around from one thing to another seemingly at random while I sculpt. And while it's not completely random, in some ways it kind of is, I try to keep things at the same level of finish, so I'll work on something like the bags for a little while, take a moment to step back, and whatever sticks out the most to me is what gets my attention. However, I don't always work this way. For instance, I hit everything except for the hands so that I could focus on those for a good long while, and that's because I hadn't touched them for the entire sculpt, as I was more so focused on the larger forms of the character than anything else. I worked on some slight changes around the eyes, and then made my way down to the lips, as promised. At this point, I was really starting to enjoy this face, and that is a great place to be. If you're not enjoying what you're working on, why are you even doing it? I think it's so funny when people say they don't know what to draw or sculpt. Make what you like! I love working on stylized characters. Even more so, I love finishing stylized characters. I'm at that stage right now when I can see the finish line, and I'm liking how it's looking. But before we cross that line, there needs to be some posing. The pose here wasn't so extreme that I needed to start that way. See my video on my athletic girl for more info on starting in pose. But even still, some things are going to change when I pose this character. For instance, the arms get pretty broken. The whole shoulder area is super complex and needed some fixing after rotating my arms so much. The rest of the pose here isn't too crazy, and it actually feels pretty stiff at first, but I treat posing like anything else. I do a first pass on it, and then come back later. Very rarely do I do anything perfectly on the first try. Sometimes, but <laughs> not very often. So I give the head a turn, adjust the legs and feet, and send us on our way. Then I enter what is essentially a corrective phase of sculpting. You have all the parts and pieces done, you have them in the general vicinity of where they need to be, but there are some small things that are off, mostly proportions. You probably have some broken anatomy at this stage. For me, I needed to make more than a few corrections and adjustments to the hair. I needed to fix my shoulders, arms, and elbows, as well as my neck. I was actually quite enjoying the overall pose of just the upper body. It was feeling really nice. By the way, I just want to take a moment and say Chelsea did a really amazing job on this unique pose. I really love the overall flow from the legs up through the character and out the hair, and how the arms accent that, all the way through the arms to the string and out the gemstone, which speaking of is next in terms of creating, because I didn't have the string yet. But it's super boring, it's really just a tube of geometry, I know, crazy, but it took a while to get right, and I think it would be pretty boring to watch, so we'll skip over most of that. Then it's back to posing for another round. I'm trying to make things more dynamic, and that is definitely achieved. It's so funny how in the moment your brain gets so used to looking at something that you can't pick up on your own shortcomings. That's why it's so important to take breaks. Refresh those eyes and come back later with new perspective. That's how I work as I near the end of working on a character. And often, even at the very end of a project, after I stamp it done, I will still see things I would like to change. But you do have to stop sculpting at some point. You push so far into diminishing returns that it can be a waste of your time. This is when you're still making changes and they may be improving your work, but they're so marginal or unnoticeable that it's not really worth the time it would take to correct. For instance, I wasn't sure if I was going to add folds to the bottom of the pants, because it was unlikely that many would even notice or look at them. All in all, when scrolling online, people will look at your artwork for an average of 3 to 6 seconds. And when you just outright say it like that, it sounds a little depressing. But you are competing for attention against an infinite scroll of content. But when taking a look back at how much time I spent on these folds, it took me less than 5 minutes to sculpt these forms. In my opinion, I think that's worth the added value. But that is something you must think about while sculpting, especially near the end of a project. I spend the next while going over making similar changes. I work on the clothing a little more, move on to the bags. I do more with the hair as well touching up just about everything as I make my way around the model. I spend more time on the hair, beginning to merge and blend all the pieces together. I wanted it to feel more cohesive, and that required blending between the parts. The focus here being on the transitions between hard and soft edges. This is something that painters think about all the time, and it's true in sculpture as well. Here's a quick view of a very rare glitch in ZBrush. I have no idea what causes it, because it happens seemingly at random. Like I said, it's very rare as well but I always like to record it if I can catch it. It typically crashes ZBrush pretty quick, so I don't always get a chance. I always think it's pretty visually interesting. It's a fun little glitchy mess of artifacting. Enough glitches for now. Let's move on to quickly adjusting the hair on the front side of the circlet or band around her head. I subtracted some cubes from the hair to make these separate segments. I used a live Boolean for that and then did some cleanup to make them feel more organic. I add some fun details to the hair that really help indicate the direction and flow of the larger form. I did this by creating tubes of geometry on the surface of the hair. 
and then adjusted their fall off to make them go from thin on the ends to thick in the middle. And then by blending it into the larger form of the hair, I created a pretty visually interesting effect that represented the original 2D work fairly well. Some of the last few things I do to this character are all the small details that you most likely wouldn't notice without a side-by-side -side comparison. Tweaks to the pants, the arms, and most importantly, the fingers that are gripping the string. I did do a bit more sculpting over there to get things looking correct. Some very small changes to the face to give it a little more expression and asymmetry. This involved changing the shape of the lips slightly, making them more narrow from left to right, and then some small changes to the nose and eyes as well. I stored a morph target for this process, which you can think of like a layer that allows me to slide between the original state and the newly sculpted one, and then choose anywhere in between the two. I did this so that I could sculpt a little more strongly than I thought I needed, and then fade back some of those changes. And that's all for the sculpting process on Chelsea's character. So next, I prepare and send everything for the character over to my rendering software of choice, which is currently Blender. I enjoy the Cycles engine quite a lot, and it's pretty easy to use, so that's a win-win in my book. Once I have all the parts of the 3D model sent over, I begin working on my materials and lighting. The materials are quick changes on the default principal materials, and my lighting starts off as a standard three-point studio lighting setup. From there, I add in more lights to better fit the specifics of the character until I get to a place where I'm happy with the result. For this character, I experimented with making the gemstone glow. Unfortunately, the light cast from the source blew out the rest of the character and didn't look super great, so I ended up ditching it all together. In Photoshop, I composite any render passes together and then make slight adjustments to levels, curves, and a couple other small changes if need be. And that's it. That is my entire process on this character from start to finish. If you just so happen to be skipping here to the end to check out the final renders, I caught you red-handed, <laughs> but no worries. I appreciate you checking out my work either way. I would encourage you though, if you like the final render here, I know you'll enjoy watching the process as well. Here's a small taste of that now, showing some of the major stages of development on the character. I would like to give a massive thank you to Chelsea Gracie. I had an absolutely wonderful time working on your character. I say working, but it felt more relaxing than anything else. If for some reason you are here watching and you did not check out Chelsea's first part of this collab, scroll on down to the description and give it a look. And while you're there, make sure you subscribe to her channel and leave her some love in the comments. If you are new around here, click that subscribe button. And if you want to learn more about digital sculpting, check out gumroad.com slash Folygon linked below for all of my courses, brushes, materials, and personal mentorship sessions. Thank you so much for watching. You have a wonderful rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next video.